I mean, it was quite a radical sight, really, to see uh, a Soviet airliner in the countryside of, of West Berkshire. Welcome to Cold War Conversations. <laughs> This is the British Broadcasting Corporation. Well, who is our first letter from today, Edward? Uh, an old friend of yours, Doris Brian Hartley of Thornton the Field, asking what's being done to build up Anglo Soviet relations. And I'm here to host this final program from the German Democratic Republic for you. Welcome to episode 18 of Cold War Conversations. Firstly, I would like to thank all those who are supporting the podcast with monthly pledges via Patreon. It is very much appreciated and has allowed us to purchase a digital voice recorder which will allow us to get out and interview people in person. If you'd like to support the podcast further and get access to some exclusive extras, go to coldwarconversations.com and click on the Patreon link on our homepage. So, on to the subject of today's podcast. RAF Greenham Common opened in 1942 and was used by both the Royal Air Force and the United States Army Air Forces during the Second World War and the United States Air Force during the Cold War. The airfield is probably best known certainly in the UK for the controversial deployment of ground launch cruise missiles in the 1980s and the resulting Greenham Common Women's Peace Camp outside its gates. Today's guest is the author of In Defence of Freedom, a history of RAF Greenham Common, and is also a director of Greenham Control Tower Limited. I am delighted to welcome Jonathan Sayers. Can you just tell us a little bit about yourself? Well, I, um, I'm, a, I'm a graduate of international relations um, and a postgraduate in international security studies from the University of Reading. And I have also written a history of Greenham Common Airfield in Berkshire, which, as many people will remember, was um, a very significant site in the history of the Cold War, certainly in Britain. Um, and it had uh, international aspects in, in terms of the later years of the Cold War um, and earlier on in the 1950s and 1960s, um, that was probably slightly lesser known. Um, so, uh, you know, that's what I've come to talk to you about today, really. Great, great. Well, um, yeah, I'm very aware of Greenham from of the the 1980s when it was uh, certainly all over the UK mm. press around the uh, deployment of the ground launch cruise missiles and the um, mm. anti nuclear protests. Mm. But why particularly have you got an interest in the in the air base? Is it just nearby to you, and you've you've got an interest or? Yeah, I think that's true. I mean, I, I grew up in Berkshire. I grew up in Reading, not too far away from Newbury, uh, which is where Greenham is, really. It's two miles to the to the south of Newbury. Mm -hmm. um, so it was never really far away from the headlines in that time you mentioned back in the 80s when I grew up. Um, and it was, I suppose it was the Cold War brought home to me in many ways. It was, uh, Berkshire has a, a number of interesting Cold War sites. And it, it was very much in the, um, in the foreground of, of Britain's uh, nuclear side of the Cold War, really. Um, so it was quite close to home, um, and it, it really brought the Cold War home to me as an individual um, growing up in the 1980s at the time, really. It was it was a frightening thing, I suppose, in the, in the way I grew up. Um, and it was the talk of, you know, people at school and far and wide around, um, and obviously on television and everything else. So... Mm. Um, and my, 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 my interest in it really went from there, really. Um, and then I became interested in, in history and uh, took A-level history and then went on to take a degree in international relations and was very interested in Cold War history as part of my degree and on and at postgraduate level too. So I, I really began to unravel what the whole story was about, really, and about how Greenham Common fitted into those. Um, so when was the, the base originally uh, built? Well, the base was originally built not like many other Cold War sites in this country. Its origins were really in, in World War II. Um, 
it was built in 1941 in World War II. Originally by Bomber Command wanted it as an airfield, as an operational training unit for bomber crews. Um, but then, of course, the Americans entered the war at the end of 1941, and events moved very quickly. Um, and it was one of a number of airfields built around Berkshire, in West Berkshire, um, at that time. So in, in that, those ways, it was nothing unique. But in those days, it was built with three runways, three fairly short runways, the longest of which was 6,000 feet. Um, and that was the wartime base. It was only ever really meant to be temporary base, like, like many were. Mm. And uh, at the end of World War II, it was abandoned and left. And of course, the Berlin blockade came, a war in Korea came, and there was, there was a permanent deployment of US forces to Western Europe, of course. And it was in those times, in 1951, um, the Americans said to the government, we want eight airfields back in this country, in Britain. Um, and Greenham Con was one of those ones identified, but it was completely redeveloped. So the war, wartime base was essentially almost entirely demolished. And they rebuilt the, the base with a, a 10,000 foot long east to west runway. Um, barrack rock combination, a fuel pipeline that was eight miles long for the national distribution line, mm-hmm. and of course um, storage area for special weapons. Um, so there's two, there's two or three phases of Green and Cotton. There was the wartime phase, and the, the Cold War phase as it came to be was quite different from that World War Two. Yeah, yeah, and I heard a very important building, local building, was demolished when they uh, did the changes. The local there pub. <laughs> yeah, there were a few buildings um, demolished. There was a cafe and there was a pub called The Volunteer, and it was called The Volunteer because um, the, the military history of the area goes back way, way back to uh, the 18th century, really. I mean, there were camp, military camps there. Um, sometimes people would shoot trips from Rock to Salisbury Plain, they would camp there. Um, and The Volunteer in refers to the rifle volunteer movement um, of the 19th century. But yeah, that was demolished in 1951. Um, and it took about two two years to rebuild the site. Um, it wasn't it, the US Army actually did the rebuilding for the Air Force. Mm. Um, of course, by by the 1950s, we were in the jet age, so aircraft were much much heavier than they were in World War Two. So the runway had to be longer and stronger than it was previously. Um, so it was quite a big enterprise really to rebuild that site. Right. And, and what sort of aircraft were they flying out of Greenham during this phase? Right, well, in the 1950s, um, like I said, we moved, moved into the jet age by that time, so it was um, it was designed to take much heavier bombers. Um, so if you consider the C-47 Dakota World War II, mm-hmm. many of which were still around in the US Air Force inventory right into the 1950s and 60s and, and even beyond, um, they were fairly light little things. But when you consider the B-36 Peacemaker, uh, which were even larger than the B-52, they were huge wow. um, with jet, jet engines and prop engines. Um, they were absolutely enormous things, so it could take one of those. Um, and bearing in mind, it could take you know six of those taking off in a row potentially. Um, KC-97 refu- air to air refueling tankers. Mm-hmm. Um, and, but the main the main new sport was B-47 Stratojets, uh, which were a six-engine bomber, a bit like a miniature version of the B-52, both built by Boeing. Mm-hmm. Um, and they had a range of about 3,000 miles unrefueled, obviously further if they were refueled. Um, so uh, that was the main strike force and sometimes you'd get at least one wing of aircraft at Green and Common at that time so that would be roughly 45 aircraft Right, and and these were nuclear armed yes. uh, bombers? Yes, they were They were, yeah, as were the B-36 Right um, and Occasionally you get visits by other aircraft I mean, we're really talking the, the period 1954 to 64, so they were the really intense years of the Cold War Sometimes you get things like B-58 Hustlers was, were a visitor, or at least on at least one occasion. Um, other times, from 1960 to 64, B-52s did come into Greenham quite regularly um, on temporary deployments. Um, and other, other sorts of aircraft would sometimes touch, touch by if there was an air show in France or somewhere or, or something, another air show going on in the country. Sometimes they'd pay short visits. But right. it was mainly the KC-97s and B-47s that you would see at Greenham at that time. Okay. And uh, the nuclear weapons were stored on site on the base, yeah. were they? And yeah, that's what, right. how were they stored? They were stored in a special area on the southwest side of the base, um, which was very similar to others that you would have found at Upper Hayford, um, Bryce Norton, Lake and East Milton, all of those kind of bases. Um, so they were in special, special igloos built into a hillside of a gully. Um, part of that site still survives. And it was later incorporated into the uh, where the cruise missile area was stored. Cruise missile area was built in the 1980s. Um, 
So that was where they were stored. And obviously aircraft in those days, the 1950s and early 60s, were kept on readiness on the ground. So a certain proportion of those would be kept in aircraft at any given time. Right. Okay. And I, I understand there was an accident on on the base during this period. Mm. Mm. There were a couple of accidents, in fact. Um, I think the main one people are probably thinking of is the one that happened on February 28th of 1958. Um, that was a plane that took off um, with a fuel fuel load headed back to the US um, and it somehow got into some sort of difficulty of a, of a mechanical nature um, there's an area alongside the runway where grass, the, the grass by the way that they could drop off fuel tanks if they got into trouble and obviously they'd release, release a lot of weight by that time mm. and each of those fuel tanks was 1,700 gallons of aviation fuel so that's a lot of fuel wow um, and somehow it got into trouble. There were quite intense winds that day. And uh, the, the aircraft uh, re- released those two drop tanks. One went through the hangar, one of the hangars, and one landed alongside the hangar. Um, now, the one that landed outside um, struck just below or just next to a B-47 Stratojet that was being worked on. Mm-hmm. Um, and the aircraft hangar had 75 personnel inside at the time. Um, and it created a huge fire, um, particularly inside the hangar. Um, I know a lot of people were were badly injured. Um, two men were definitely killed, um, and the B forty seven on the ground that got that got, that got uh, well that caught caught fire. Um, it got so hot the ammunition on the tail gun began to fire off, um, and it created a huge plume of smoke. Now part of the problem with the fuel was and the, the fire was that those aircraft were partly made of magnesium. Magnesium mm-hmm. is very, very difficult to extinguish. Yeah, um, I mean, that's what they use it in century bombs. Yeah. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. Um, and there, there, there is, there are ways of uh, extinguishing a magnesium fire, but apparently the uh, the equipment required wasn't wasn't kept on the base at the time. I know fire crews far and wide from RAF Odium in Hampshire and Reading and various other places came to Greenham. But there was one. It could have been much worse. It was a Friday. Um, and in those days, a lot of airmen made their way up to Paddington Station in, in West London. They'd go to London for the weekend. So a lot of people, and it was a paid day, a lot of people were actually already off base at the time. So it could have been far worse. But there was talk in 1996 that the, the plane that burned had a nuclear weapon on board and uh, there was a, a trace of plutonium, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. Um, I really don't believe that that was actually true. Um, because the aircraft in question was being worked on. It wasn't in one of the alert areas where it would have been um, uploaded with a weapon at the time. Um, and I personally think it was a bad accident, but I think it was, I think the nuclear side of that was probably more of a scare story. Um, I don't actually think there's any fact. Yeah, I think the, the way, the, the, absolutely. I think the way you describe the circumstances is there's no way they would have a nuclear weapon on a plane they were going to no. be working on. Um, no, no, and I think I think I read as well is that that somebody did a, a ground survey as well and found no traces mm. of radioactivity yeah. whatsoever. Mm. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I I know men men uh, who were there on, on that day that are still alive today and that, that are in, in in reasonable health. Um, so um, I think that's a bit of a scare story that that aspect of it. But it was a bad fight and people did die. Yeah. Um, but so there was another accident, another B, B, B-47 crash-landed at Green in 1963, in February of 1963. Um, but that was, uh, one person was killed. There was very heavy snow that year, which was piled alongside either side of the runway, and it created a sort of aerodynamic effect whereby I think the pilot thought he was getting out of control. Um, he decided to eject, but the, the parachute didn't, didn't deploy, so he impacted on the runway and was killed. Um, but the rest of the crew managed to get control of the plane and they affected a bit of a, a crash landing. But there was that incident. But um, they were the only real accidents and incidents to of any real significance. Yeah. So the this is tra- strategic air command aircraft, these are, mm. aren't they? That's um, right. Yeah, that's right. And and so when, when did they leave the base? Uh, well, they left the base in uh, June of 1964. Um, and this was one of a number of closures at the time. I mean, Upper Hayford, um, or um, Bryce Norton and RAF Fairfield were handed back to the Ministry of Defence at that time, um, and Greenham Common was too. Upper Hayford was run down slightly, but didn't close. Um, so it was within those um, US Department of Defence cuts in 
1963 and 64, they shut the base down. But it was also at a time when the B-47 shuttle jet itself was beginning to become an outmoded platform, really. Um, of course, we were into the um, submarine ballistic missile age as well. So yeah. with Polar Polaris coming on force, I mean, things like bombers on the ground were very vulnerable, especially in the age of Sputnik and, and Soviet ballistic missile technology as it developed by that time. So forward bases in, in Europe were beginning to get more and more vulnerable. So it was quite a complex picture of events, really, but that was when, uh, when they decided to shut it down. Right. And then what, what was the base used for then, after it well, was from, closed? From 1964 until 1967, uh, it was handed back to the MOD, uh, and it was used for a few minor things. There was a civil defence exercise there, I know, in 1966, uh, which I've seen some photographs of. But essentially, it was just left on a care and maintenance basis, really. Um, I think there may have been some MOD staff there that looked after the place and cut the grass and things like that. But yeah. essentially, it was, it was just an empty reserve airfield. Um, but then the political climate in France and Europe changed, and Charles de Gaulle announced in 19, I think 1966 that he wanted all American bases in France. And there were a number of, mostly Air Force bases in France. Um, there were about seven, eight, nine, maybe. Um, mm. he, he, he demanded they were to close by 1969. So what happened was the U.S. Department of Defense decided that they'd move some of those units to West Germany and they'd move some of them back to Britain. Um, and some of, some others would just be disbanded and closed down. Um, so it was in that climate that they decided to reopen Greenham Common in January of 1967 and it was handed back to the U.S. Air Force. And in that period, really, it was partly, it was just uh, undertaking a number of um, fairly small tasks, really, mainly of storage of equipment that was moved back from those French bases that closed down. Um, the hangars were used for storage of anything from pinball machines to desks and typewriters and that kind of thing. Oh, well, um, the, U the US Air Force can't travel far without a pinball machine, I take it. <laughs> no, no, no. Um, so it was that kind of machinery, really. But the, the numbers of staff there, I mean, in, in the peak of the Strategic Air Command days, you probably would have seen to, um, I don't know, 2,200 personnel at Greenham, Greenham mm. um, plus any aircraft personnel that moved in on temporary duty. So a, a lot more people, whereas in these times, 1967 onwards, yeah. we're talking probably less than 100 people at Greenham. Right, right. And and was it just after this period that there were some air shows and things like that going on at the base as well? Yes, I mean, um, the uh, well, the Embassy Air Tattoo, as it was called then, um, started at North Weald Airfield in Essex, um, which was a World War II airfield, and it had been handed back to... Uh, been civilianized, I think, in the late 1960s. Um, it was a fairly primitive runway, and they built a motorway at the end of it. So um, it was felt that as that air show was expanding, it needed a better site, really. Mm -hmm. um, and if you look at Greenham Common on a map, it's very central in the south of England. It's about 50 miles or 55 miles west of London. Um, by that time, you had in the early 1970s, the M4 was finished, um, and it's got a train line that runs immediately to the north of it. So it's got three train stations within very easy reach. Right. So this, the um, Tim Prince and uh, Paul Bowen, who uh, who ran the International Air Tattoo at the time, as, as volunteers, in fact, they approached the, um, the officer in charge at Greenham, the American, and said, um, could we use your airfield? And they said, yes, we, you know, we'd love to have you. So um, from 1973 until 1983, it was the home of the, um, of, of the International Air Tattoo which grew and grew and grew. And then by the last one they had in 1983 at Greenham, it was accommodating over 200 aircraft. Wow. Um, but it, it wasn't held every year at Greenham. It was held most, there were seven seven air shows at Green Air Tattoos, um, and one small show called the Newby Air Festival, also organised by the same, same group of people. Um, but it did begin to um, do the odd years with, um, the Farnborough Air Show. So the Farnborough Air Show is held still every two years. So by the time we got to the end of the 1970s, they uh, they wanted to alternate. So one year they'd be Greenham and one year they'd be Farnborough. But, right. Uh, yeah, it was a it was a huge event really. Um, you had air air aircraft from as far away as Australia and New Zealand. Um, yeah. A lot of uh, obviously a lot of US aircraft, a lot of RAF planes, West Germany, um, most a lot of NATO countries, mm. um, Austria. Uh, yeah, it, was, it became a huge thing. Oh. Um, very well, very well. And is that the air show that ended up at Fairford? Yes. yes right. Oh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. 
Wow. I hadn't realized it had got that large. It's amazing. <laughs> oh, yeah. I mean, in, in the last year, it was, it was a real spectacle because you had the SR-71 Blackbird there, um, which to see an air tattoo, other than, I mean, the RF Mildred Hall, of course, where it was based, you would yeah. see it from time to time. But to see it at any other base in England was really something. So yeah. um, to see that and the TR-1 alongside, that was really quite something. Yeah, yeah. Very popular with the Soviet embassy, I would imagine, that air show. Uh, well, it's, that's interesting, actually, because we had um, Tim Prince visit recently. He came back to the control tower in Greenham, which is a, something perhaps we'll talk about later. Yeah. Um, but he said the Soviet the Soviet Union was invited to attend the air show with aircraft, and it was seriously, um, they did seriously want to do it, but um, the Foreign Office and Home Office weren't too keen, um, probably for a number of reasons, really, but Aldermaston isn't very far from Greenham at all. Right. Flying time, it's a very, very short distance, yeah. probably only about five miles as a clay five. Um, and they were, you know, for, and, and for other probably quite other obvious reasons, um, they didn't really want Soviet aircraft uh, on British soil, yeah. Yeah, I mean, I, I'd, I'd sort of read that the Aeroflot aircraft would often sort of deviate off course and mm. would be possibly um you know taking photos of sites and i can't believe the soviets didn't know where aldermaston was oh, of course yeah absolutely yeah absolutely um but um i mean that became a whole nother issue really with other air other american aircraft that were proposed at greenham um they didn't really want aircraft um i mean if you, you consider I mean, aircraft that were carrying aviation huge amounts of aviation fuel yeah anywhere near aldermaston yeah um, although yeah of course, they were 1950s and 60s, um, but um, obviously things changed a little bit. I mean, aircraft regulation have in- increased and increased over time, um, so they didn't want aircraft anywhere too near um, overflying that area, really. Yeah, I suppose so. Yeah, no, I can understand that as, as a mm. uh, as a legitimate reason. So, uh, 80, well, the the early 80s, certain political mm. decisions are made around mm. um, a different type of nuclear missile mm. so yeah. The, the, yeah can you just talk through that you know that that change in um uh purpose of of greenham mm. yeah sure um i mean just to go back a little bit before we get to cruise missiles um mm. it's worth mentioning a couple of other things because in the late 1970s greenham the, the u.s air force did want greenham for um deployment of kc um KC-135 and KC-10 tanker aircraft to support the F-111s that were based in England. Uh, and they did look very seriously at Greenham Common, um, but there were protests against it because uh, by that time, the towns of Thatcham and Newbury had expanded post-war a fair bit, really. Um, mm-hmm. um, so Greenham's not actually that far from Newbury or Thatcham. It's only less than two miles. So the, uh, it was felt that people, local people didn't really want aircraft to return to Greenham. Um, well, at least some people didn't want them to return to Greenham because of noise and so forth. Yeah. Um, and so that was ruled out, um, and then they went on to RAF Fairford in the end. But right. um, I think the um, MOD and the US Department of Defence looked at Greenham for cruise missiles because uh, cruise missiles obviously weren't aircraft dependent, really, apart from their initial delivery and servicing. Um, yeah. They wouldn't really require that many aircraft movements. So I think that Greenham was seen as a base where you could deploy something like a ground launch weapon um, and it would be an ideal place for it because it wasn't very far from Salisbury Plain where you could do training. It wasn't very far from um, another American base in uh, in Berkshire called RF Welford um, where there were already people permanently based at uh, USA and still are to this day. Um, uh, and other, other support facilities, it wasn't very far from London uh, or Heathrow. So moving personnel would be... Uh, would be easier than other places. So I think it was partly in that, it wasn't just the international um, background in the Cold War and so on. Mm-hmm. There were quite practical aspects about deploying cruise missiles to Greenham. Yeah. Um, mm-hmm. But obviously, like you say, I mean, the, one of the main challenges was the, uh, the what was seen to be the disparity in, in the arms race as we got from the 1970s into the 1980s with the Soviet deployment of SS-20s. Um, and they said they were withdrawing their SS fours and SS fives from Eastern Europe, mm. um, but at quite a slow pace. And of course, the SS twenty had three three warheads, and the uh, the older missiles had just the one. So, yeah. 
technically they may have been um, with, slowly withdrawing older older weapons, but the new ones that were coming in um, were also mobile, whereas the SS4s and SS5s weren't. They were fixed. Um, yeah. So cruise missiles really were felt as a as part of the solution to plug that gap on the NATO side. Um, although they were actually quite different weapons because cruise missiles were subsonic. They had a range of 1,500 miles. Um, so in some ways you could say they're almost more a political weapon because by the time uh, things got really intense, um, I mean, even an F-111 bomber could make it to the Soviet Union faster than a cruise missile could. Um, so there is a question about whether the cruise missiles were serious military weapons or were they more of a political thing? I mean, there is some debate there to be had. But of course, at the same time, in West Germany, you had the deployment of Pershing-2 missiles, which were ballistic. Mm. And they could reach the Soviet Union within a very short time, about six minutes. Yeah. Um, and they were the weapons, I think, that really worried the Soviets because they could be targeted on things like their command structures and things like that. So if you think you can be hit yourself in six minutes, it really did focus their minds. Um, but, um, yeah, it was in that kind of environment that cruise missiles were seen. Yeah. In in Britain, we had 160 were earmarked for Britain, 96 of which were due at Green and Common, and all of which were delivered eventually by 1986. And RF Molesworth in Cambridge, in Cambridgeshire, uh, which were to have the, um, the, the other 64. Mm-hmm. Um, so that was the kind of environment that we were in, really. Yeah, and, and how, uh, it'd be worth explaining just how the ground launch cruise missile was deployed, what, how it was mm. intended to uh, operate, because it is quite an unusual weapon, as you say, it's a bit different. Mm, yeah, I mean, most people will know cruise missiles now in the conventional sense launched from submarines. They've been launched, of course, many, many times since the end of the Cold War against Saddam Hussein, um, in Yugoslavia, and more recently against Syria. Um, so, I mean, cruise missiles themselves can be launched from ships, they can be launched from aircraft, and they can be launched from the ground. Um, the ones at, at Green and Corn were built by General Dynamics, um, and they would be launched from from armoured trucks really. Um, there was in a cruise missile flight, there were six flights of Green and Common, there were sixteen missiles in each flight, A, B, C, D, E, and F. And uh, a flight was made up of um six launch vehicles, sorry, sorry, four launch vehicles and two support launch control vehicles. And in time of war they would deploy to pre surveyed sites. When I say pre surveyed, I mean pre surveyed by helicopters and ultimately then they'd know the coordinates of where they were um, and of course cruise missiles were satellite guided um, so the sat nav you've got in your car is dependent partly on the technology kind of technology that was developed for cruise missiles um, so these pre-surveyed sites would probably i would say be in wooded areas where they could conceal themselves with camouflage nets and the like and they would dig in for special positions um, and in these flights of cruise missiles were US Air Force Security Police, which to explain it were, I suppose, probably an equivalent of the British RAF Regiment. So they would defend um, assets, be it aircraft or missiles and that kind of thing, Yeah. Um, both in their bases and, and on deployment locations. So they would dig into a fixed, um, they would dig into a location, build foxholes and that kind of thing, defensive positions, conceal themselves, and then they would just await the launch orders. Um, if the launch orders were, co- were to come, the officers involved, um, they wouldn't know where they were launching to. They'd just be given the codes and they would launch. Um, so that was the uh, that was the method of deployment. And it was interesting, just an aside really, that uh, for most US Air Force officers, um, it was very rare if you were a missile launch officer to be posted abroad because, of course, most of the uh, missile assets were, were based in the, in, in the US itself. Yeah. If you were, a minute man or an Atlas uh, launch officer. So to be posted abroad as a launch officer was really quite something unique and special. Mm. Um, uh, that was really something quite unusual for the US Air Force at that time. Right. And so, you know, as a result of this deployment, the mm. ground launch cruise missiles were very much the focus of the of the campaign for nuclear disarmament and the, mm. Mm. you know, the general anti-nuclear um campaigners and i think that that's where greenham well this is the period that greenham common is probably most famous for Mm. Mm. is the deployment of the ground launch cruise missiles and Mm. the uh peace camps that were around Mm. the perimeter of the base can you Mm. talk a little bit about that 
Well, the, uh, the C&D, of course, was formed in 1958, really, I think that it was really, uh, I think the threat, the fear, the fear of uh, a, a war and attack by the Soviet Union was growing, really, from the late 1970s into 1980, I suppose, was when it really began to kick off. It was in June of 1980 that the um, Ministry of Defence announced that the cruise missiles were becoming screened in Manaro if miles worth. Um, and I think you know, a number of things at that time were happening as well nationally. I mean, the Prote uh, Protect and Survive booklets were issued in 1980. Right. Um, and it was, it was within that kind of psychodrama, I suppose, that the, uh, some people felt the threat of nuclear war, you know, the, Soviet, the Soviets were about to attack. Um, yeah. So that kind of mentality and fear was gripping the nation, not just, not just Britain, but similar things were happening in West Germany, the US, um, other countries in Europe, Netherlands. Um, so it was within, within that wider context, I would say. Um, I mean, the cruise missiles, I, I don't know, it's hard for me to say specifically why um, the protesters really got so worked up about that, but uh, it really began in 1981. There was a, a, the walk that the initial protest was a march from Cardiff um, to Greenham Common itself. Uh, and they stopped a couple of other military sites en route. Uh, and the idea was that they would deliver a letter to the base commander expressing mm -hmm. their, um, well, their protest really about cruise missile deployment. Yeah. Um, but by which time, of course, by 1981, there were no cruise missiles at Greenham. It was just a proposed base at that time. Um, and I think they were given short shrift really by, by the RAF commander who was there at the time. Um, and they said, well, they, you know, they were prepared to wait to speak to whoever really. Um, and I think it was that, that kind of, it was the kind of, um, the tone the with which they were received, which, which kind of provoked their displeasure in some way. And I think that made it more of a, a kind of course celebre for them. Mm. Um, and I suppose every protest or every, every kind of movement has its particular place, if you think about it. Um, and, and, and Greenham Con really became the focus of, of mm -hmm. what was to come. Uh, I mean, in those days, of course, communications were a lot more primitive than they are in, 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 you know, in this current time. But um, I suppose it had certain influential people in the media that took upon this uh, this, this particular story. And I think if, if it didn't have the publicity, it, it probably wouldn't have gone very far. I mean, yeah. like with most things, there's a bandwagon effect if you hear about something. Um, but... Um, and I... Go on. Sorry. Uh, go on. And things worked up. So from 1981, um, people were occasionally making these visits in the protests. And into 1982 and 83 was when it really began to work up into a much bigger kind of stage of protest. Um, and of course, it had ended this press headlines, and I think, um, you know, men were excluded, and it, it became. Uh, yeah. Um, they were blockading and tearing down fences, and uh, which, which, let's face it, in those days was something quite unusual. I mean, for attack a military base is something, and certainly very unusual thing to have done in those days, um, tearing down fences and making a song and dance. Yeah. Um, and in 1982, they did a thing called Embrace the Base, where they linked hands all the way around Green, which is about a nine mile perimeter, and also connected that with the other. Um, British nuclear bases at Burfield and Aldermast and by hand. So that's a lot of wow. people involved. Yeah. Um, yeah. And um, the media take notice, of course, of things like that. Mm. Um, and then cruise missiles eventually came to Greenham in nine, November of 1983. And then once that was there, they, um, then of course, it, uh, they decided you know, to stay and uh, they were determined to, you know, in their, in their words, get rid of cruise missiles. Yeah. And I, I suppose it's it's looking at it from a purely... Um, straightforward point of view, they're an easier weapon system to protest against because mm -hmm. they have mm -hmm. to leave the base on yeah. the road. So therefore, yeah. as a peace protester, you mm -hmm. can obstruct or, you know, damage them or, or whatever, potentially. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, how, that that yeah how, how effective were the peace campaigners in preventing deployments or affecting the operation of the base? I, I don't think they were effective at all, really. I think they like to say they were effective, but I think if they were effective, I mean, cruise missiles would never have come to Greenham yeah. um, and never have stayed at the time that they did. I mean, the armed forces are very professional, uh, be it American or British, and there were a lot of British armed forces deployed to help secure the base. 
Mm -hmm. um, there were over 220 powers, um, British Army powers deployed at one time. Um, they were also um, boosted by the RAF regiment. They had quite a big deployment there too, all through the cruise missile period, um, as well as MOD police and civil police. Um, I think that they made a nuisance of themselves. They made, I suppose, they made life entry and exit the base difficult, and they, they actually attacked um, airmen and, and some civilian personnel. They attacked their vehicles. They smashed windscreens. They caused a lot of damage. Mm. Um, they painted vehicles, um, and they even pushed things like prams in front of you know vehicles at times when they were, yeah. and you had no idea as a driver whether there was anything in that pram or not. Yeah. Um, but so but there were different factions of the peace, you know, the, these groups, uh, and they weren't very peaceful, really. A lot of them were um, understood quite hostile acts, and some of the things they did were really quite beyond the pale. Um, I'm going from police reports here, police mm. witnesses. Um, but there were different factions. Some, some were were genuinely peaceful. Some were um, of a Christian background or Quaker background. Uh, but there were different factions. But there were some hell bent on causing trouble. Yeah, um, vandalism and attacks, and uh, um, you know, attacking, throwing things at personnel, and, and throwing bricks and stones at vehicles. Um, and there was, of course, always the question of, you know, how far the Soviets and Warsaw Pact services got in, in infiltrating the, in these groups. Yeah, um, because that would be a, a logical step. Um, and I know I, I'm, I'm told that East German radios were found on some protesters. Um, and on our side, of course, there were you know, countermeasures against some of those things that were going on. Yeah. Uh, I know that there were special, I know special branch for a fact were at Greenham um, and, and quite possibly other services as well. Um, so, you know, it wasn't just the Cold War site tense in terms of the military sense. There was, there was a serious kind of infiltration war going on at the same time. When does the, the cruise missile deployment end i know that there's the inf treaty mm, mm. um and does well, that yeah. signal the sort of removal of the ground launch cruise missile yes it does i mean if we go back slightly i mean 1985 yeah. um, mikhail gorbachev came to power of course um and I, I should say the negotiations with the soviets never really ended i mean in, in 1982 we had um what's called the dual track decision so uh, NATO were negotiating with the Soviet Union to um, remove intermediate-range nuclear missiles from 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 well, Europe, um, but of course the cruise missiles and the Pershing twos hadn't been deployed at that stage. Mm -hmm. um, but those talks went on through the 1980s, despite the the high drama of the, the Chernenko and Andropov years, and of course they 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 passed on, and then it became Gorbachev. I think Gorbachev was much more enlightened. Really, he had contact with the West prior to coming to power. Um, and of course, Mr. Thatcher said famously that he's a man that we think we can do business with. Um, and that was the case with I think that he realized that the Soviet Union economically was in a hell of a state. And that if he had any hope of turning communism around, he had to, um, you know, reduce defense expenditure. Um, and the INF Treaty that was signed uh, in December of 1987 was a real breakthrough in arms, arms control agreements in, in as much as it completely... Um, it, it eliminated a whole class of weapons, which had never been done before, really. Um, intermediate nuclear range missiles from uh, the Warsaw Pact to NATO. Um, and that was to be enacted over a three year period from 1988 to 1991. And that covered all cruise missiles, which were also deployed in Italy, um, Belgium, the Netherlands and West Germany as well, as well as Britain. So um, the cruise missiles at Greenham, Soviet inspectors began to move in in July of 1988 they did what they called baseline inspections to see what cruise missiles were at Greenham, uh, where they were stored, uh, what kind of facilities they were. And that's when uh, Aero so, so, sorry. came into Greenham itself. Yeah, I was, I was just going to say, so you do finally get Soviet aircraft at, at Greenham, yeah. albeit not how yeah. you expected. <laughs> no, no. It was, it, I mean, it was quite a radical sight, really, to see uh, a Soviet airline uh, in the countryside of, of West Berkshire. Um, it was a real, I mean, if you think five years before that, we thought the only thing they'd be sending to Green and Cotton was a ballistic missile, um, yeah. not um, not inspectors um, signing the agreement to withdraw those missiles. Yeah. Um, so it really was a breakthrough, um, a real international breakthrough. Um, and similar inspections were happening at those other cruise missile bases across Western Europe. Um, and the first cruise missiles to be withdrawn were withdrawn in August of 1989 at Green and Common. Um, and the final ones were withdrawn. So withdrawn in March of 
So uh, gradually it meant from that period from 89 to 91, the number of personnel at Greenham was gradually run down. Um, the missiles were you know, gradually withdrawn, the vehicles sent back to the US or disposed of. Um, and the exercises which happened typically once a month were wound down. Uh, and the last one happened in 1990. Um, so um, by March of 1991, the last cruise missiles left. And the 501st Tactical Missile Wing, which was the unit responsible for crews at Greenham, was uh, inactivated at Greenham in June of 1991. Right. And so then the, the base closes again? Well, there was a period in 1990, 1991, where I think the US Department of Defence was kicking around different ideas about what they could do with Greenham. There was talk of... Um, an updated version of the F-111 bomb being based at Greenham. There was talk of F-15s being based at Greenham. Um, so, I mean, if you consider, it had one of the longest runways in Western Europe. It had a, by the mid-1950s, it had 12,000, it was a 12,000 foot runway, which is very, very long. I mean, there was a, a longer air, airfield in Spain, but when you're talking 12,000 feet, that's an awful lot of runway. Um, yeah. And NASA actually, served, NASA actually surveyed the runway as an abortive landing ground for the space shuttle in 1980. So you could have landed all sorts of aircraft there. Yeah. Um, potentially the, the space shuttle could have landed there if it had to. So um, there were various ideas kicked around, but by the end of 1991, I think the US Department of Defense was looking to withdraw a lot of, withdraw a lot of personnel from West Europe, Western, Western Europe, including Britain. And so that was when they decided the, um, it was surplus requirements for the US Air Force, and it would be handed back to um, our Ministry of Defense. Right. So the base finally closed with the US Air Force in September of 1992. And then what, was it just derelict from, from then on? Yeah, it, it went back to being, um, you know, a, sur you know a, surplus, um, a surplus facility, of which there were many, of course, at the end of the Cold War. Um, RF Bayford, um, many US Air Force bases across Western Europe and Britain were, were then handed back to our Ministry of Defence. Um, and there are about 100 U US uh, military facilities in Britain. If you go back to the early 1980s, there were a lot of bases in Britain. Um, intelligence bases, runways, depots, facilities, communications bases, um, US Navy bases as well as Air Force. Um, and gradually a lot of those were um, handed back to the MOD. Um, so um, it was still with the Ministry of Defence until 1997 um, when they declared it to be surplus to requirements. And that was when it was uh, part of the base that the technical side, if you like, was handed, um, was, was sold to a local organisation which became the Green and Common Trust. And they ran the technical side of the business park. Um, but the runway was broken up in the mid 1990s, from about 1996, 97. It was, it was broken up for concrete. And some of that concrete was used on the Newby Bypass, which is again another very controversial. Um, project with a lot of protest and yeah yeah it's somewhat it. ironic <laughs> yeah yeah it is um so that just left um a lot of the, the, the base was still left there even by about 2001 if you went there a lot of the the site was still fairly intact apart from the runway but certain areas it's worth mentioning were still off limits because of the inf treaty the inf treaty doesn't have an expiry date um so it's it's in effect in perpetuity but the, the Russians still had the right to inspect certain areas. And there were three areas they could inspect. There were the area, the, the gamma site, as it was known, which is where the cruise missiles were stored, um, the vehicle maintenance area, and one of the hangars, which held a cruise missile simulator. And they were still entitled to inspect those until 2001. So, uh, and I saw those, those facilities, um, by which side they were derelict, really, and there wasn't an awful lot to see. Um, only the gamma cruise missile site now remains. Um, and actually, the last Russian, of course, by that time it was Russian rather than Soviet, inspection happened in 1998. Um, wow. By which time, <laughs> the Air Force had long since you know, gone. There was no runway they could land aircraft at anymore. Yeah. Um, but it was just you know, the final yeah. inspection. They, con they, yeah. they, they convinced themselves. Did they come on the bypass then? <laughs> <laughs> um, Oh, I don't know. It's, I'm not sure it was actually open at that stage. No, but, um, no. Yeah, um, but they would have flown in somewhere like Bryson Norton, I suppose, um, yeah. and gone from there. So what remains today? What is there anything that can be seen there? If you know where to look, um, there are still some places of the Cold War site that you can see. Um, 
If you go onto the business park near Greenham Park, you can still see some of the base buildings remain. The base chapel is still there. And that's got a stone that was laid by the base commander in 1955 that you can still see. Right. Um, the base, one of the base fire stations still remains. Um, the old non-commissioned officers club is still there. Um, a couple of other huts and storage buildings are still on the, what I call the technical site, if you like. All the barrack blocks were demolished in the late 1990s. But I suppose the most interesting two things that you can see at Greenham Common are the, the gamma site where the cruise missiles were held, um, which is owned by a private company. Now, it's not it's not normally open to the public, I have to say. Mm-hmm. Um, and the, the control tower, um, the aircraft control tower, which I'm a director of a project, a charitable project, um, which is to be uh, reopened to the public this September. And we are having trial opening through the summer of this year um, with a cafe and we'll have a museum there about Greenham Common and the base. Um, so that's, that's there. You can also see the old Officers Club, which is a building built in the 1870s. That still remains and probably will remain because it's, it's grade, grade two listed. Um, that still remains. Some of the old Air Force housing remains as well. Um, and there are other odd sundry buildings that you can see. Um, but that's about it, really. Right. Well, there's more there than I thought, to be honest, because I, you know, I, I thought it was just the control tower and the uh, the cruise missile shelters. But there's obviously um, more there if you know where to look and what you're looking for. Yeah. Yeah. If you know what you're looking for. There's also a fire training plane that you can sit. Another, another, another very significant building I've forgotten about was the old 501st Tactical Missile Wing um, headquarters building, which is of great Cold War interest. It's a brown building, a two-story brown building that just looks like a rectangular office block, but built into it was a decontamination site and a hardened command post. Uh, None of it is actually really underground. It was only really designed to be proof against chemical, biological, or napalm attack. Um, But it's very, very interesting, and I have to say it is open to the public partly or the decontamination side is open to the public this September um, I think it's the 8th and 9th and again the following weekend so it's worth looking out for that if you get a chance to visit it's very yeah. very interesting um, it's not very big but it gives you a real flavour of what a Cold War site was like um, you know that would have been at war um, you can be decontaminated by you go through a stage, different stage process whereby your clothes will be taken off and you'll be showered and you'll be covered in um, full of earth uh, there'll be different checks uh, on sensors in the ceiling um, and some of the machinery they've got there still works to this day um, and it was connected to a command post obviously once you've been decontaminated you've been yeah. to the command post and the command post had um, boards on it and it was uh, have top secret details of where cruise missiles were deployed to and the like and I did go in to see it in 2002 and it still had details up about um, the Soviet INF inspection visits on the board, which is very interesting. Wow. Um, but it's a classic Cold War 1980s building. I mean, the type of which you would have seen across places in West Germany and Belgium, the Netherlands. I mean, this was really designed to be a very secure yeah. site, oh. but it's built just to be inconspicuous and just to look like an office building. Yeah, right. I'll have to check my diary for September by the sound of it. It's well uh, worth a visit if you get a chance. Yeah, no, thanks for that. What is your favourite Cold War era film? Well, I think if we look at the Cold War, Cold War era film, there's lots of favourites I suppose I've got, but I think one of my favourites is um, is a film called By Dawn's Early Light, which uh, stars Rebecca de Mornay. It was made in 1990, of course, by the time the Cold War was just about finishing. Um, it's not a very well-known film, um, but it's, eerily true to life I suppose in some way in some aspects of things that were happening about the um, the breakup of the Soviet Union and about loose nuclear weapons and things like that and it's it's like a case study of a B-52 crew what would happen if if a nuclear attack actually happened and about how chaotic were things things could get potentially um, about how the president loses his control and about how um, how nuclear war would, you know could potentially get really out of control very very quickly um, about wrangling between the armed services and about how command and control would or wouldn't work. So that I would say is probably my favourite film. Okay, okay. I think I have seen bits of that on YouTube. Um, mm. 
because she's part of the crew, isn't she? The B fifty two. That's right. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. No, it looks like a really interesting film. Okay. Yeah, that's a is. good. That's a good one. I haven't had any other guests suggest that one. Um, if you were making a film about the Cold War, what piece of music would you have as the soundtrack? Oh, um, I don't know. It's, um, there's all sorts of songs. I mean, um, Cold War. So there are a number of Cold War songs that I grew up with. Ninety Nine Red Balloons is, is one one that comes to mind. But yeah, I think that's, that's a bit more of a frivolous one. But I mean, Depeche Mode made a song called And Then, which is about. It was kind of it, it was made in. I think it was from about nineteen eighty two, eighty three, and it was about how the world was divided and how. Um, how dangerous things were, but how things could be put back together again. Um, it's quite a quite a sombre song, but I think really that that would be the one. Okay. It's called and, and it's called and then. Um, and then. Okay. Time again. Yeah. Okay. No, that's a good one. Thank you. Um, have you got any Cold War items that you've collected? Yeah. Well, I've got a lot of I've got a lot of, in terms of Cold War items. I've got various bits and pieces, obviously connected to Green and Common. Mm -hmm. um, there were a number of coins that they minted, um, special collector's coins. There were two. There was one that, that was minted 30 years ago for the first Soviet INF inspection visit. Um, and they came in a special blue flip-up presentation case. I've got one of those, and the, the wing, the 501st Tactical Missile Wing, also minted another one in, I think, 1991 when they were disbanded. So I've got those. Wow. Um, I've also got a manual for one of the cruise missile recovery trucks a, a man so when i say man i mean Ger Ger the german company machine in Augsburg, nuremberg <laughs> uh, which produced the cruise missile trucks i've got one of those that one of the airmen's given me yeah um i've also got a field manual for how a cruise missile deployment would work in the field um which is very very rare um i'm not even sure i should have actually um <laughs> but um it's covered in a wax it's like a like a notebook but it's covered in a waxy um plastic cover so I, yeah obviously if you're in mud mud and rain and everything else it needs to be um it needs to be waterproof yeah and it's fascinating it tells you how to deploy how to dig a hole what to do in case of certain events what to do in case of chemical attack and it's absolutely fascinating wow that does sound really interesting it is um, um, and I've, I've no idea how it got out into the public but i bought it from someone about 12 years ago right um and i've also got a book that someone gave me in the u.s of um, what it was like to be deployed to England as an airman in 1954, which is very, very, very rare. I mean, I don't know how many must, must survive, but she found it at a garage sale. Yeah. And just emailed me and said, would you like to have it? And I said, oh, yeah, I'd love to have it. Thank you. <laughs> um, and it's got names of officers and then senior NCOs that were there in that time. Yeah. About what it was like to live in England in the early 1950s. Uh, and it's absolutely fascinating. Wow. Um, that, I would say, was probably the most treasured thing I've got. Yeah. I've got. But I've also got a lot of the base magazines from the 1980s, where they're called the Common Crier. Mm -hmm. And someone recently has passed away in Thatcham, where I live, who had one of the 1960s Air Force newspapers, especially for Greenham, called the Common, uh, the Greenham Herald. Mm. I've only ever seen one of one other before ever, so that is extremely rare. So I've got a couple of real rare items to do with Greenham. Wow. No, those sound really fascinating. Mm. Particularly mm. that 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 cruise missile deployment manual sounds mm. uh, yeah. fascinating. I'm sure it other is. people wouldn't find it fascinating, but it definitely uh, grabs grabs my attention. Mm. Um, mm. If you could invite three personalities from the Cold War period to have a few beers with, mm. who would they be? Well, um, there's an interesting one. Um, well, I think it would have to be. Um, I think it would be a number of, I think uh, President Bush Senior, I think, was a fascinating man. I think because he'd been head of the CIA, um, he really was a Cold War warrior in the true sense, really. Um, yeah. Not just having been a US president, but of course he was there at the very end of the Cold War. Um, he had that CIA background. He, he, he it would be a fascinating man to talk to, I'm sure, about Cold War strategy and uh, about the downfall of communism. Yeah. Um, I'd be fascinated to talk to him. Um, but also, I think someone like General Eisenhower as well, who, for similar reasons, you know, he'd, he'd been a general in World War Two. He, again, was a Cold War warrior, a two-term US president who'd seen the build-up of um, 
for the nuclear forces in the 1950s. Yeah. And he warned about the, the military industrial complex when he left office. And I'd always wondered what was it that made him so specifically concerned about that? I mean, he'd been a general officer in the army. So it seemed particularly ironic that he, he himself was warning about that. I'd love to know why exactly that was. Um, that is a particularly interesting. I, I, mm. I absolutely agree with you there. I mean, mm. his warnings about the military industrial complex, you just don't expect from somebody of that, I don't know, background and mm. e experience. I think you're right. Mm. That would be a fascinating person to speak to. Mm. Who's, who's your third? I think it would be Margaret Thatcher, really, because she was there at the, between the superpowers, really, and was, was there at the hot and interesting times. And I think that she, she was a foreign policy prime minister, really, that was very aware of the East-West divide uh, and Britain's role in it, really. Um, yeah. And Britain, I think, you know, really did play an important part in the, in the Cold War years um, for many reasons, of course, being a, a, in support of the special relationship with the Americans and being host to all these different bases, um, like I mentioned, and also a power in its own right, really, with forces deployed to West Germany and um, other parts of the world. Um, she was very aware of all these Cold War things that were going on, but I'd be really interested in her perspective about the earlier Cold War, about the Cuban Missile Crisis and about um, the growth of Soviet power post-war, really, and mm. her, her take on it, really. I think that would be interesting. Yeah. Yeah, I mean, she was particularly anti-German reunification, wasn't she? Mm, at the mm, end of yeah. the Cold War, which was mm. um, very much against the tide there. Mm. But yeah, no... Although it's not entirely, yeah. Well, I mean, Henry Kissinger was warning about that as well, really. Yeah. Um, but uh, yeah, yeah, I mean, that, that, those would be probably the three I'd be most... In. I mean, others as well, potentially. Yeah. Um, you can have a fourth, go on. Uh, Henry Kissinger, I think, would be another yeah, yeah. person. Yeah, yeah. Um, but um, but for different reasons, really. I mean, he was another Cold War warrior, really, of, but more in the 1970s and about yeah. detente and not Ostpolitik and those kind of things. Yeah. No, that's a good, that's a very interesting bunch you've got together there. Um, are there any books that uh, cover the history of Greenham Common at all? Yes, there are a couple. Um, one is called. Um, one was published last year. Penny, Penny Stokes, The Common Good, uh, mm -hmm. The Story of Greenham Common. That was published last year. And that's a, that's a general history about Greenham Common from, from pre-military years to the build-up of the base, World War II, yeah. and, and, to its, um, and to its closure. Um, there's also a, a book um, by myself um, called In Defence of Freedom, A History of RF Greenham Common. Um, and I wrote that in 2006. Um, that's more specifically about the military side of the base, uh, World yep. War II, the Cold War, um, some very interesting facts and figures, um, and the whole history really. So there, there's accounts by airmen, um, and it covers a bit more about the Cold War background and those kind of things too. Okay, now that sounds good. And that's still in print, is it? Can you still yeah, get that? Yeah, that's available um, from a website called lulu.com. Oh, okay, great. Are there any... Uh, videos that you found on YouTube or anywhere else that you think uh, sh well that sh either show Greenham or show some of the operations within Greenham yes. that might be useful for people to get a better insight there are a couple yeah there are a couple um, there are a couple of videos on YouTube you can see um, one was a two-part documentary made in 1994 um, by a company called Milestone Productions, which no longer which is shut down now. Uh, that's about the issue at that time of what would happen to Greenham Common, but it's got some fairly good footage of the base as it was intact in those days. Mm -hmm. um, so that's that's available. And there are a couple of other snippets about Greenham on YouTube. Um, and I know, so, I mean, some, obviously in those days we were pre-internet, so um, there were bits and pieces that, you know, from further back, yeah um, that are available yeah. um so there are there are a few things there's, there's not an awful lot really but there are a couple of things jonathan that that's all i had is there anything else you wanted to uh cover at all um i think i think that's fine i mean i think that uh i would invite people to come to the control tower at greenham common and see the history of it um and also my 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 twitter account uh which is um Greenham Skies, 
you can find out, you can see photographs of various aspects of the history of Greenham Common on there. Yeah, there's um, some great, I've been of, following that. There's been some really interesting photos you've got on there, particularly I was fascinated by the INF, the Soviet uh, inspectors. On yeah, there. that yeah. was really interesting. Yeah, so I'll be posting all sorts of material on there. Um, and there's also my own website. I've got my own website about Greenham Common and the history. Um, you can see some of the material that I've been discussing there. Um, and the address of, of that is um, www.greenhamcommon.org.uk. Great. Um, and you can read, read the history of, at, at much greater length and depth on my website there. Yeah, okay. That is great. Um, Jonathan, I really appreciate your time tonight. You're okay, welcome. Well, that's it for my discussion with Jonathan. I hope you enjoyed our chat and found the content interesting. There's extra information in the show notes. The show notes can be found at coldwarconversations.com slash the word episode and the number 18. If you like what you're hearing, please leave reviews on iTunes or with your podcast provider. Thank you very much for listening and supporting the podcast. It is really appreciated. Goodbye. This is the Voice of America, Washington, D.C., signing off. 